Hi there. Welcome to Microbiology Journal Club, where we know out big about all things small. My name is Danny, and in a previous life I dropped out from my PhD in microbiology, then I was a fact checker and editor for pharmaceutical advertisers. Nowadays, I'm a member and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based at NYC, dedicated to aim at the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz, and I have a BA, PhD in microbiology. I've mostly worked on bacteria, but I've also worked as a research bit. We should. I'm currently working as an editor for Scientific Journal, and I'm working my pronunciation. Um, <laughs> uh, every other week, we meet to talk about microbiology, and on a typical day like today, we do an overview of some of the coolest microbiology papers that we've seen in the last two weeks. We also like to do deep dives, so if you want to make it, allow us to delve deep into the paper, look into every figure and the methods, uh, then please message us at microtwjc if something has caught your fancy and you really want us to take a look into it. Yep, you can follow along with the papers that we discuss in either week in our shared Zotero library, our social media handles, and the links to that library are in the doobly-doo below. Yeah, and we want to hear from you, so please use the comments or tweet us at microtwjc. So what kind of papers do we have today, Danny? Uh, yeah, today um, <laughs> we have a great selection of things, uh, starting off with, well, actually not, not in this order, but I found something about nanomotors for ramming into bacterial cell walls, um, a nucleolus in archaea, the largest clinical trial of a TB vaccine, but for COVID, uh, bacterial proteins that mimic eukaryote histones, and bacteria that flock towards these electrical cable bacteria. Ooh, and not only that, we also have a designer recombinase that can fight cancer-causing viruses. We have also look at how parasites use beetles as taxis. We also <laughs> have uh, how the body ejects infected cells during an infection, and also engineering cyborg bacteria with magnets to fight tumors. And finally, can a plant fungus infect a human being? Is this the last of us? Uh, <laughs> No trade, no trademark, uh, whatever. I, I'm off my game again this week. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think without further ado, we will start off with our first paper, which is BCG vaccination of healthcare workers does not reduce SARS-CoV-2 infections, nor infection severity or duration. A randomized placebo-controlled trial. Yeah, I mean, if people get a sense of like the speed at which science moves, like I think uh, in 2020 we covered a paper that was talking about this phenomena that, like BCG vaccination, which is for tuberculosis. It's um, like a Mycobacterium bovis strain. It's very old. Um, it's a very old type of vaccine, live attenuated. So, so it, it, it's alive and just sitting around, um, but it r lacks some uh, virulence factors. So, you know, it's okay to stab into folks. And um, uh, there was a report that said that people who had been vaccinated with this BCG vaccine, so in, for example, in the US, people don't get vaccinated from it, but a lot of other countries do. So it was some observational study that said, oh, hey, like, looks like it has some effect on SARS-CoV-2 infections. Um, and that was super exciting for people. And uh, they did a bunch of placebo controlled trials and we're seeing the results of the largest placebo controlled trial right now done with BCG. Um, it's done in healthcare workers in the Netherlands in the Uni University Medical Center of Utrecht. Uh, uh, but it didn't seem to really show any great uh, results. <laughs> Yeah, this is something that I feel like we were kind of skeptical about when it first came came around. But it was I mean, cast your mind back to 2020 where we didn't have any viable vaccines and and we got and there are people who are very very desperate mm -hmm. for anything that could have any level of protection. And BCG was one of those vaccines where there were there's this thing called trained immunity that happens. Am I correct? Where mm -hmm. you you can like inject BCG and it just generally like gets the immune system on alert. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, I think it's supposed to be some like non-specific, like um, yeah, just general activation of the immune system. I think it's people said. I think there is more positive results on the. Um, there's more positive results on the flu. I think there's an interaction with flu that it has. Um, yeah, I mean, it, there's there are good mechanistic reasons why people think it would work, but again, like you don't know until you see the data. And here, I think they have like. Um, thousands, a thousand people, they were able to split into two arms, a placebo of about 600 and um, an active group of about 665. Uh, they did like, they looked at asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic cases, they looked at severity levels. Um, and in all in all of these cases, they didn't really see any effect uh, coming through. Um, the authors do provide some, in their discussion, they provide some 
um, thoughts to why they think this could be the case. And they thought about maybe it's actually like um, latent tuberculosis. <laughs> like maybe maybe part of it is that like you know places that have higher tuberculosis rates might uh, actually have some you know cross protection to COVID something like that. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, because they say it, the 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 where they saw positive. Um, where they saw, oh yeah, or like maybe when you get vaccinated, it also matters. Like if you were got vaccinated early in your life, it somehow gives you like a better impression. Mm. Again, that's just speculation on the author's part, but yeah, they're just trying to interpret because there have been um, clinical trials. Like they cite a Greek trial called Activate 2, and, and that does mm. have a positive effect, um, uh, at least uh, for, for, for COVID-19 cases. Um, yeah, and in, in, in India, they also saw an effect. So it's like, it's one of these things where I guess the data is pretty murky, but this is such a large study, like more well-powered than those previous, those, than those previous studies gives us an impression that maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I feel like just the concept, it, because essentially like it, it almost pitches as a smear of mycobacterium bovis as like a miracle cure that can cure everything. And I feel yeah. like, that is a bit there, there could be something there but i feel like if there is it's too subtle for for it to be useful in a clinical context mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah I, I, I you mean, can imagine that like the way we think about vaccines typically we're raising at these like super unique and high titer antibodies towards very specific things like that sounds like it yeah, the, it, um, having a more generalized effect, there might be a little generalized effect, but could it be as powerful as um, when we're really directly trying to engineer uh, specific immune responses? Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like it's it's an adjuvant in need of a vaccine, I feel like. The, <laughs> un, once we understand how it, how it does what it does to the immune system, I think there is a lot of potential there, but just like... I think I, I think part I of don't it, have as part much. of the excitement around it though is because it's such a you know it's being used for such a long amount of time right it's also it's generally regarded as safe in so many different contexts um, like the the ways people make it like people know how to make it so like it's exciting from that perspective right that it's like something already in our toolbox that we could be using against other things but um, but yeah I guess in this yeah. case maybe not really for <laughs> SARS-CoV yeah I. I understand why it's so tempting to keep going after this uh, hypothesis uh -huh. because the potential is so amazing. The idea of having a, a vaccine that can kind of, it, it not, not cure, just kind of help you survive an infection a, a bit better than that. And so, that can help against multiple things. That is a very tempting hypothesis. And yeah, so, uh, but yeah, I, again, I feel like this, this study kind of does a lot to, to state that maybe it isn't going to be that useful in a clinical context. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So that's all we want to say about that. And that's all the SARS-CoV-2 coverage we actually have for uh, this week. I mean, we didn't even talk about it last in two weeks ago, right? <laughs> yeah, no one's talking about it anymore. We just accept now that human lifespan is, is lower oh, now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and we're always going to live with it. Or not. Uh, <laughs> I saw like um, a really funny toot going around the Fediverse with that dog sitting in the fire room. The this is fine dog. And then, and then the dog's just saying, like, the fire is endemic now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, yeah, you bring up a very, very good point. So I'm going to uh, let us me see if I've still got that background in my oh, yeah. inventory. <laughs> I don't. I deleted it. Oh, well. <laughs> All right. Um, the next paper that we're going to cover... Uh, is autonomous treatment of bacterial infections in vivo using antimicrobial micro and nano motors. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, this is this is an in incredible paper because I mean, it's not something I generally think about, like the micro and nano motors. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like I think I um, think we even like we touched upon like this doesn't sound really weird, but I remember we talked about maybe many episodes ago, something about swarming behavior. I think we did a deep dive on it where they like made yeah. like swarming bacteria and they saw that like things get jammed up and that causes like some shift in whatever. Um, the, I feel like nanomotors were part of that 
part of the discussion that we covered there because it's like a it's an area of physics that people are really interested in like what happens when you add like you know directional movement to like particles even if there's no steering involved just the fact that they're moving around gives them new properties and new ways of behaving um so in this case like yeah they're just they have a, a enzyme urease um I didn't even know that this could be produce any motor force, but for some reason, <laughs> when you adhere urease to small uh, particles and then you give it its substrate, it produces some charges and that produces motion. <clears throat> Interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I suppose that, that motion is urea, but basically that so it's, you, it's something about well, the catalysis of the yeah, it's the catalysis of the urea on the urease that creates ch charges, I guess. And then those charges in this, in the context of like tiny particles causes random motion. So that like now they don't, have, these particles don't diffuse anymore. They, they just scoot. They, <laughs> they kind of like zip around and that increased motion. Um, yeah, I guess that increased motion, the thought is that I guess they will ram into bacteria at some frequency or at a much greater frequency than before. And thus these particles can be used to deliver payloads of antimicrobials. Yeah, that is an interesting idea because I, I can see what, because like essentially you're superpowering diffusion with it. Yeah. You're, you're taking what's there already uh -huh. and you're biasing it in, because uh, I remember like the old school like enzyme kinetics, how those work. Essentially, you're just like powering up one part, the the K of that equation or something, and then making and making sure that your your molecule just bumps into much more. Things. Yeah, so I, I can see how. Yeah. You know, I think that that's like a really interesting way to think about it, right? Like if we think about enzyme kinetics as like having enzymes needing to bump into their substrates. Imagine if like killing bacteria was like getting bacteria to bump into their like these like scent bombs of like antimicrobials. <laughs> mines maybe they're like automated mines um yeah so <laughs> so they use particle tracking to get a sense of like what's mo they can like see the movement um and they also like correlate that to uh like the charges that they're able to measure on the surface um so they can get a sense for like yeah like these these molecules they are moving more and uh and it's based on the charge that they're getting imparted uh yeah it's so weird these particle tracking. I mean, this is a modern miracle as well, right? Like being yeah. able to do single particle tracking of super tiny things. <clears throat> I mean, I remember like how much of how much trouble I had even just attaching a camera to a microscope and now it's just <laughs> <laughs> now you can yeah, track multiple tiny things under a microscope. Uh, they also have to add in uh, AMP uh, as like, I guess, part of the energy um, uh, part of this movement. Uh, they actually don't have a clear idea of the exact physics that goes into it, which I also find slightly fascinating, which is why I sort of open by relating this to like physics research, because I feel like um, there's just like a bunch of physics people that are interested in tiny molecules that move around and knowing how that happens and knowing different ways, mechanisms is part of part of the research here, right? Because you can imagine if this becomes an engineering problem where we accept that increasing the diffusion rate and the motion of tiny particles makes them better antimicrobials, uh, we could start swapping out the different ways in which we achieve that motion uh, to try to find better outcomes. Um, the two things they do play with in this paper, though, are the micro and the nano scales. So they have like, really, they have mm. tiny, they have tiny moving balls and they have really tiny moving balls. Um, and they're made with, um, I thought the, the way they make them is kind of funny. They like start with like polystyrene spheres and they coat them in something and then they dissolve away the yeah. polystyrene and they, that leaves a hollow, a hollow sphere. <clears throat> yeah, that's, I mean, it's fa fascinating. I think that because you've got the physics, physics part where they have to analyze, it, analyze it and then the biology part where there's something that we don't know about and th th we don't know how it works, but let's just go with it anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they take it all the way to a mouse model. Well, uh, yeah, first you have it, you have this image. They try to figure out like how it works essentially and they only have two crude ways that they're trying to differentiate it. One is like they can look at like the release of molecules from inside the periplasm and they can look at like the membrane depolarization, which also would release different molecules from the periplasmic space. And so, yeah, they're able to yeah. kind of figure out that um, it's not really bursting holes so much as it's depolarizing the membrane that allows things to leak out. 
Um, but of course, they're also delivering these antimicrobial peptides into the whole thing, and like that action of depolarization is is killing can kill cells as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they take it all the way to mice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they take it all the way to to mice, and I f I feel like the the my my state is less convincing to me. Uh -huh. uh, just just because like uh, I feel like. Um, I'm, let me, oh gosh, I hate, sorry, this is so hard for, oh, to for me because zoom into the scientific papers are the only ones where you click on the figure and it makes it look smaller, <laughs> so it's, but I, I feel like the, they, they've, they've got some interesting data, but also I think the supplementary material where they're measuring the size of the infection site and they're trying to demonstrate that the wounds are more open, and then you can see in some of these pictures where they literally have forceps holding the wounds closed, and I'm like, hmm, is that an honest representation there? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, but, this is one of those. This is I. Some I don't pay attention sometimes to these final figures when when it's so obvious that the initial technology is super experimental and they're really just figuring out the kinks of it. Then they like run yeah. it into an animal model just to give it that significance element. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of like, okay, it's, it could be, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Yeah, I, I feel like it, there is something there. I just feel like maybe like they, they could have represent, maybe they didn't choose the right animal model because again, mm -hmm. you're looking at something that, that, that travels much wider in a fluid. Mm -hmm. And a wound infection model has lots of tissue and other places. And you can argue that maybe there's more penetration there, but I think there's a lot of complexity that could I think that that's, make... Yeah, I think that that's what the authors are trying to argue, though. Like, they choose this model because they think, oh, it's because, like, um, like without motion, these particles, like, can't really diffuse well in, in this system. So, right, they have, like, the, the same particles with motion and with... Or they add urea, or they don't add urea. Anyways, they they're able to say like motion on or no no motion. And I mean, I think they they do because they do some experiments where they they carve up the wound model. So half of it they do it where they've applied the the molecules, and the other part is where they a bit further away mm -hmm. to try and demonstrate that the molecules are diffused away from it. Mm -hmm. And I am not so like the so for instance in in these figures. In, so I think it's this figure. Uh, where they, they on one end they, these are the molecules that are close to the where the, the these are the CFU counts for when the molecules are directly applied, yeah. and these ones were for, for where they're farther away, and I think that I'm not sure I can see what what the whether there's much of a difference there. Um, yeah, like it's kind of like day four. What are the two halves of this graph? D. Uh, yeah, I. So this is uh, this was taken at day four, and the two halves of these graphs represent this diagram here. And oh, then, I see, I see. Yeah, either <laughs> yeah where it was directly applied so, or where it wasn't. <clears throat> yeah, and I'm oh. trying to un understand. So what... It doesn't seem like it's it actually really moves across treating with the peptides. Alone. Yeah, I see. On the area where they treat with peptides alone, nothing nothing really happens. Oh right, I see. That's that. all it is. So this is like their yeah. control for just the peptides yeah. alone. Okay, I, I was misunderstanding. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that not about movement at all. It's just like this. This modality is good at delivering these peptides, but otherwise the peptides would just rinse. I think the thought is the peptides get rinsed away, or like they're just like they're just small proteins, right? And they don't. They they can only work on diffusion, so they can't get into this place, right? This complex tissue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think it's maybe just my my issue of like no. Not being able to understand these figures as well as I think I, mm. I need to. Um, but, but I also think that it's not that, like, right, like, again, I don't understand, like, like, why are we moving so quickly into animals? I mean, the partially is because you want to see it, like, work in this in vivo scenario. But there's also many other design considerations that I think aren't fully fleshed out right now. Um, that like right. right. So really, like, if this was a clinical yeah. study, then you would be looking at like safety or like off-target stuff. Like, what about like does it ram into regular cells and fill them up with antimicrobial peptides? Like that could be a bad thing too, right? Like, um, yeah. I just think that uh, these this is a classic way that these papers unfold, where like they want to add a lot of significance at the end. Doesn't always land one hundred percent. Yeah, I think that that without this, it is still a very good paper yeah. and it's very mm -hmm. presents a very interesting model, mm -hmm. and it, it would have been like even more fun if they just uh, say did like two buckets with like bacteria in them 
and then add the one the molecule and see how much faster the bacteria died off in one and the other. And I think they have they I'm sure they must have that somewhere here. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think that they've they've got it's an interesting model. I think there is a lot more design before it can be done in vivo, but I think it's a nice basis yeah. for something that can Yeah. Yeah. And and everyone loves nanotechnology, so like let's, let's Yeah. <laughs> always interesting to I see mean, what's out there. It's still like a very young field, so we can't expect it to do everything uh, at the same time. Okay, talking but... about strange, overly technical and engineered um, therapeutics, uh, the next paper we have is Modular Designed Engineered Bacteria for Precision Tumor Immunotherapy by a Spatiotemporal Manipulation by Magnetic Field. <laughs> yeah, uh, so this is a very interesting paper. So these are the cyborg bacteria talking about where uh, so last time we were on here, we talked about how, how they designed a bacteria that seeks out tumors and releases, that explodes and releases a cytokine to attract the immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, but this paper is looking at something slightly different. So what they, what they kind of do here is that they, uh, they're trying to solve a similar problem. The idea is that they want to direct bacteria towards a tumor and then release all of the whatever is inside the bacteria to, at, the, at the same time. Um, so this means so this means like they can use a lot of anti-cancer drugs that they might not want to be able to use before because a lot of anti-cancer drugs have off-target effects. So they can be really bad if they get out hit cells other than the tumor. So if you you really want the just the tumor cells to be affected. So they so the idea here is they want to be able to control when bacteria release all their their stuff inside there. So in here they're experimenting with a uh, with a specific drug that is known to be quite good against tumors. It's like an antibody that hits um, a don't eat me signal. So <laughs> all cells have a don't eat me signal that they send to the immune system to say, hey, we're normal, you don't have to hurt us. And the immune system says, okay, that's fine. And tumor cells also do this, which is bad because we want to hurt mm -hmm. them. So, well, uh, so it's a CD47 antagonist or something like that. You um, can imagine if, I, if, I forget. if that antibody gets out into like at, on your regular cells, then your regular cells will get attacked by um, by uh, your immune your immune system. And so I think they said like it has a like a pretty bad effect on like blood. Like if you have too much of this antibody yeah. in your blood, then like yeah, your your blood starts getting eaten by your immune system, and that's not a good thing. So yeah, the first step is that they create an, a nanobody for this because they're encoding into bacteria, and antibodies have very long genomes, mm -hmm. so making that as efficient as possible to converting it to a nanobody. And then the second step is try and get it to go to a tumor. So what they have is they've programmed a genetic circuit that 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 allows it to home towards uh, the tumor. Yeah. I, um, it just seems like it's by like, well, first of all, I think we've talked about this before. Bacteria just find themselves accumulating in, in tumors in the first place. Um, yeah. And so I think part of their, I mean, look at this like diagram where they have like the machine, like they're really envisioning like they've made a tiny robot. <laughs> yeah, so they, they really cl clarify things into three bits. Active navigation, which is what we're talking about now. Signal decoding, signal feedback, and signal processing that leads to a signal output. So the output is death, as illustrated aptly by this machine gun. Yeah, a, a um, gatling gun. <laughs> but we just talked about it. It's an, it's an antibody. <laughs> Yeah, that's the nanobody. So that's the the bullets that we want to eventually release. Yeah. And the tumor targeting is where they put some uh, some protein, some uh, some yeah, uh, really just histone like proteins protein. that attach to heparin sulfate protein glycan. So these protein these are upregulated on tumors. So they're generally overexpressed in colon cancer. So the idea is that these will seek colon cancer cells specifically. But again. These are found on all cells, so it, it can be quite leaky, but we're relying on the fact that they find tumors specifically. Yeah. Um, and then and then again, like the they're even adding more things. So that's all in the genetics, right? Those are all changes they've made to like genetic circuits and expression on the E. coli. But then they have this, for their signal decoding uh, element, they have something where they're augmenting the cells themselves by adding in this like iron oxide sort of element that gets, uh, chemistry to the surface of the bacteria. So they make modifications of the bacteria so they have the right like sugars sticking out, but then they use some chemistry to like adhere um, these metal particles on, onto the bacteria. And the reason why they want metal particles is because they can use magnetic fields to heat them up. So essentially 
uh, being able to warm these bacteria uh, with uh, alternating magnetic frequency. Or, yeah. Yeah, I think that in itself seems like a cool idea of like, oh, you can get these bacteria to go into a tumor and then cook it from the inside out. Uh -huh. And that's where like I would have stopped and, and part of my flag is that, hey, I'm done. But these research, because I think the main thing they want to do is to to actually control like when to control the genome and how it works using heat, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is they do something very clever where they take some uh, heat. They have a plasma with like a heat sensitive promoter. Mm -hmm that only activates at 42 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. um, and they, the idea is to use heat to turn that on. So a lot of this work is actually them trying to make sure that they, these nanoparticles get to the right temperature <laughs> and release uh, the, the, like, and then get to that 42 degrees so that then they can know that their promoter will work. Yeah. So you've got these like thermal images of, of mice being heated up. So they, <laughs> they implant these, uh, tumors with the well, they plant these mice with tumors and then give them the bacteria and check whether the bacteria go to the tumors and then heat the the tumors up yep. to see whether the bacteria have have not only reached there but also whether they can reach the right temperature. Totally. And they do and, some ingenious things. Well, I just want to say, sorry, like, I keep um, talking over you. No, it's fine. I, I just want to say, like, this is like related. This idea of like adhering stuff to the surface of the bacteria, we've seen it before. We actually covered it in a, a news episode at some point, like bacterial nano armor. Like they had coated probiotics in a layer that like resists antibiotics. So you could like give an antibiotic treatment and then the bacteria would be like limited. So like, I don't know, it's like a really interesting approach. The introduction has a whole bunch of different examples. They talk about like cell, they could cut, you can coat bacteria in like the cell membranes from red blood cells. And that's like another weird like, <laughs> you know, equipment. We're talking about like equipping microbes with like these like molecular tools or like when you, the backpacks one, right? When you said like, you could like add like, you know, alginate backpacks to these bacteria and that like gives them something for their local environment. Um, so yeah, it's like quite fascinating. And like now that you have magnetic particles on these uh, bacteria, you could also use magnetic fields to move them around apparently uh, in, in the body. <laughs> yeah, they, they do some experiments with that later. Uh, which I will go into. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, I'm just Im impressed because I think the idea of controlling bacteria using like a manual... So we have optogenetics, mm -hmm. which is the field where you can shine a little blue light on a bacteria and get it to turn on a gene. But there, And that'd be an ideal system, but except humans aren't transparent. Mm -hmm. So that means that trying to use, use like light to manipulate, to turn on genes and bacteria is very difficult. Mm -hmm. But magnetic fields do go through humans very easily. And therefore... You can actually use magnetic fields to control the ge genetic expression of bacteria, right. but it's very difficult to do that because the way that magnetic fields interact with like magnetic, I mean, there, as far as I know, there is no genetic switch that can be turned on and off by magnets until kind of now where they've yeah. found a, they a way they bootstrap to bootstrap into off. heat, right? Like they use the heat to, the heat from this yeah. magnetic field is, yeah, is being able to um, turn on ge genetics. <laughs> Yeah, I feel that's why they didn't just stop at cooking it because they thought, well, actually, we can do something much more intricate and much more like refined. So we can, so it almost as like a proof of concept that we can now get control bacteria inside the human body, but we and they can be used to release all like say these anti-cancer med medications, but they could you could use this kind of control to release all sorts of medications. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very interesting concept to to prove. Yeah. So I mean, in they so that's why it's so important for them to prove that this activates at 42 degrees C. So they have like various like dyes that only activate like when it, it releases at the right temperature. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, they do a lot of work in this paper also to characterize like immune response, like what's actually going on in these tumors. What does it mean to release CD47? Like what, you know, uh, macrophages and what dendritic cells are being activated. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a yeah. huge paper. <laughs> They they do a lot they do a lot to try to show us that this is working and and I like that they're also trying to show us how it's working which is like you know also the sometimes the most interesting thing about these papers because we know that the end technology isn't going to be as is transplanted into humans so like getting mm. some sense of like the how it works is really the information that we need to you know take those designs to the to the next level meaning you know, human testing or whatever is required to to see where it's going to move on.
Yeah, uh, they they do a lot to like focus in on say making sure looking at say how how affecting treating one tumor can affect other tumors because there is this effect where you sensitize the whole immune system to the tumors. They also look at say how it, how this antibody com how this compares to the real antibody and looking at the side effect profile as well, mm -hmm. just to kind of demonstrate that their hypothesis is kind of correct in that idea that they are targeting the tumor specifically. And my favorite part is what you mentioned before, where they get the tumors to home in on on the, the they get these bacteria to home in on the tumors by literally putting them a magnet near the where the tumors are. Yeah. And then letting the bacteria like migrate towards yeah. that. Figure nine. And then, figure nine is the, the motion one. <laughs> Where they have like, yeah. these, like diagrams of a mouse in magnetic coils. <laughs> yeah, I mean the way you, we can mag manipulate magnetic fields so well now, so we can literally direct like magnet direct our bacteria to a specific spot. And here, what they basically did is like plopped a neodym in my magnet, like right next, right where the tumor is, and <laughs> let the bacteria like accumulate in that position, uh -huh. and then uh, test out whether it can shrink the tumor and help the the mice survive and and it looks pretty good actually yeah another interesting element i thought like it's not just even about homing the these bacteria into the tumors themselves but i think they they give the bacteria orally to mice and then they like increase yeah. its retention time within the gut so like again these are like colon colon cancer or whatever so like yeah just having the bacteria hang out in that area where it's going to have effect um is also like important <clears throat> yeah so i think oh no this is like a really like really interesting concept because you've got like a way to signal bacteria to get them to release a compound you want them mm -hmm. to and you also can move them around the body so it this feels like the most nanomachine -y paper i've it's read it's very in, well, no offense it's yeah. very robocop it's very robocop <clears throat> yeah it feels very future very fantastic voyage kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right um up next, uh, we have this paper, um, Precision Excision of HTLV-1 Provirus with a Designer Recombinase. Yeah, so HTLV-1 is a human T-cell leukemia virus, which uh, is not something you'd want. And the, thing, the key thing about leukemia viruses is that they spend most of their time integrated into the genome. So we can try and create, create drugs that stop them from entering into like a specific region. Um, so like targeting the capsid or other things, but once HTLV is integrated in the genome, it's, it's quite hard to pop out as I understand it. Mm -hmm. And once it's in there, it can. And that's, and uh, that, that's also true for retroviruses, right? That have an integration phase. So, yep. so there's a whole bunch of viruses that, that live integrated into genomes. So there's no current way that people think about how to cure that. You, you mostly just ensure that your immune system is dealing with the virus as it comes off. Um, but having some way to yeah, go yeah. in and maybe excise these proviruses would be really cool. Yeah, it's an interesting, like, because usually what would be thinking is, once it's in, the kind of immunity you'd be looking at is killing off the entire cell, mm -hmm. but the idea here is to, like, excise the virus and then allow this, the cell to heal itself, I presume, or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, but in order, so this is great, because we've got, now we're in the era of, like, next generation recombinators. We've got, like, Casper, Cas CRISPR, we've got mm. Cre. Um, well, so they well, looked at no, Cre specifically. Ca Cas is not a recombinase, though, right? That's a that's a sniffing. Oh, and I think that that's why. Yeah, that's right. That's why, like this this technology, or, or why the authors are going after Cre and and recombinases in general is because there's no like moment where your DNA is just in two pieces, like with a cut in the middle. Mm. Like recombinases, they're just like they 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 pick up the two ends and they like join them together at the same time, removing whatever was in between. Um, and so like that, I think that from the safety perspective, they're hoping that like using recombinases would be better because they don't have to worry about like the, ex the existence of a break at any point. Yeah, that's a good e diagram to show you like this process of just like excising things. A and it's something that's super common in research. Like the Cree lock system is the backbone of all these mouse lines where you have the recombinase being made in a specific tissue type and so then only in that tissue type does the gene of interest get excised and you get these uh very specific knockout uh, mice yeah the, the one main limitation of LOXP is the fact that you have to have like this specific target sequence on the on the genome in order for Cree to 
to activate because otherwise it won't recognize it won't be able to bind to it mm -hmm. so these researchers try to get around that by essentially trying to find th find sequences on the htlv that might be interesting sites for locks might be good sites for locks p and then they evolve the recombinase to attack those so uh, i think the first step of this paper is then just trying to find the target site so looking at something that looks like uh it, like a 13 base pair inverted repeats with an eight eight bit uh, base pair spacer sequence and so they they try they do some algorithms to try and find a bunch of sites that are similar to that in htlv mm -hmm. and then then once they find that final target site they start to evolve the right recombinase so they use uh s slide uh which is a way i guess a way of evolving uh recombinases uh -huh. to fit to a specific site yeah and once it's they essentially evolve I, I read i read a brief description of how that slide works it's like they have their they, they have to do it stepwise. They can't just like give the final uh, site that they're interested in and like say only the things that can excise this thing will survive. They kind of use right. like a hybrid approach. They like slowly make that sequence more similar to um, to the one that they're trying to target. And uh, if the Cree recombinase is able to remove it, then it removes an element that like sort of destroys the plasmid, let's say. So then they're only ever passaging plasmids that have a Cree recombinase that can excise that specific region. Um, and that's how they get, they, that's how they get a richer and richer, uh, ver, uh, or a more and more specific version of a Cree recombinase that, um, yeah, that works on a different site. And, and they're introducing diversity through like, um, uh, they're introducing diversity through like leaky PCR stuff, right? Like error prone PCR techniques. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, this is like an amazing way of trying to, of again, because again, like I've always thought of Cree as very like specific. limited as it's to super a specific, specific site. Yeah. And I mean, that's why people use it because yeah. it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't look at any other site. And so having this idea, like yeah. let's use directed evolution to give it new sites. Um, yeah, it's just like a great, uh, great idea. And I think that that's one of the things I'm very worried about is once they thought that once they'd like change the site, there might be a lot of leakiness. Mm -hmm. So another thing that they were trying, a thing they do a lot in the study is testing the safety of re the recombinase. So every now and again, they always go back to mammalian cells to see whether it exercises any other part of the genome. And they get a multiple candidates that they screen to make sure that they're safe. And yeah, finding the best recombinase is again, a, a major part of this. So in terms of the engineering steps of it, it they, there is a lot of that that aspect to, to it where they look and another thing they also try and look into is also the mutations they create in the recombinase because once they create one that is very good at doing what they want that can excise HGLV, they they look at how it actually binds to the d genome so that again this is helpful for the designers in the future who want to also uh, look at how to design a new recombinase. So understanding this, what structures work for this one can be helpful for mm. other recombinases in future. Yeah, I, I um, love it when right, papers do that, right? And they're, they're, you're not so focused on like, does it work for this therapeutic purpose? But like, we're doing research, right? We want to know like, why does it work? And like, some of those lessons could be useful for fields that are not even related to this, right? Like, these are people that could, they're, 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 there are scholars out there that are just studying Cree recombinases for the sake of studying Cree recombinases. And they're still going to enjoy reading this paper, <laughs> um, uh, even if they don't care for this like therapeutic application. Yeah. And they, they move through several stages of looking at, say, firstly, whether it exercises HTLV on like in normal cells, then they go into whether they can do it in, say, in, can in jerk at T cells, which have like the HTLV one inside mm -hmm. them. And then they do it in looking at cells derived from an actual patient. So the kind of the steps you'd want to see in a, in a study like this. Yeah. So And this is a, oh yeah, this uh, is just a pre-proof that we're looking at. But it is, it has been peer reviewed, right? <laughs> it has been peer reviewed. It's just that for the, they've just been trying to put it together, I think. So the final part of publication is tends to be very long, where you think like, oh, it takes three months for peer review. And then it can take ages for people to actually get get down to putting it together into a real looking paper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, it's, at that, it's at that stage. So maybe in a week or two, we'll get to see the full online paper in its full glory. But at the moment, it's in the pre-proof uh, pre stage. All right. Um, so moving on, the next uh, paper that we have is paratracheal abscess by plant fungus ch chondosterum purium. First case report of human infection. 
So I don't know if you've seen The Last of Us. I, I haven't, but... <laughs> but I know it is a fungal infection but... that makes zombies, presumably. There's lots of cord- yeah, so... cordyceps content going on around on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, a lot of cord- and I feel like this this basically entered into my my like search algorithm because uh, I've read it and gone, oh, this seems like they're saying a lot of the stuff that this. So one of the th- re- so. Like from microbiology's perspective, what I was taught in in microbiology school like ten years ago was that fungi are very bad at infecting humans because humans are because we, we've got like warm internal temperatures, so we're we're less vulnerable. So fungi don't like it when it's too hot, which is why they're good at infecting cold-blooded creatures like amphibians, but not so much at like affecting humans. So so being having a high internal temperature tends to protect us, and then the lot then the Last of Us comes along and. Uh, we I started hearing about this hypothesis that actually because of climate change, the climate change is causing funguses to adapt to higher temperatures, mm. and therefore that means that <laughs> our warm there might warm be... bodies might be suitable. <laughs> yeah, which I thought. Well, I mean, this isn't the first time the climate has been at a hot temperature. I mean, it's not like we hear about funguses killing off the dinosaurs. I think uh-huh. I feel like there I mean, would be. We, how would we have evidence of that? That's like hard evidence to find. Yeah, true. Uh, <laughs> If we only we had like fossils of dinosaurs riven by fun- cordyceps fungus that would prove this, but <laughs> then I read this paper and I was like, oh, actually, because Condrosterium purpurum is a plant fungus that causes silver leaf disease of plants. So the idea is that it, it affects like rose plants and it causes like cells to die off to make the leaves look all silver. And what we have here is the inst- an instance of a researcher who researches fungal diseases studying quite a lot of these like rotting material and then he came down with a um i think it, like with oh, with like pharyngitis hoarseness of voice sore throat cough uh fatigue like kind of very like cold flu kind of looking symptoms and he mm-hmm. was and they tested him and they found that there was something there was like something bad in his uh an abscess in his chest they mm-hmm. they took out the abscess well they aspirated it Look, try a sample, try to identify it. They found it was a fungus, but none of the funguses we're used to coming to see. So, yeah. and they found that it was actually this weird plant fungus that somehow infected a human. Um, and it's wild because this guy's not immunocompromised in any way. The yeah, he is like perfectly healthy. But but the person does have a very interesting job. They are like uh, they work with uh, plant fungi. <laughs> yeah, they, they work with plant fungi. So and then you go, oh well. Yeah, a plant mycologist. Yeah. So, like, they're in an environment that they're, I guess, probably always covered in spores and things. <laughs> yeah, and that's a little thing that they don't really tell you about the microbiology job that really does make... Is that at some point you you might accidentally infect yourself with one of the things you're working on. And mm-hmm. so you need to be very careful and not clumsy. Um, <laughs> but... I mean, there's, like, there are classic stories that people died from what they were studying. Um, when I went to school, like... Uh, we were in the Howard Taylor Ricketts, something like that. Like he died from yellow fever when he was studying that. <laughs> oh, I, m- I remember like going. There's this microbiol. There's this microbiology conference conference we went to, and there was like an outbreak of uh, of pharyngitis, and then each researcher was like, link in different labs across the world were like, hold on a minute, was this spread by by two people making out one time? And... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I know that like um, there's always jokes in like cholera uh, conferences. There's like um, there's like a there's a cholera type that transmits through oysters, and so like <laughs> so if you have like a nice fancy like you know cold tower of oysters at a cholera conference, so many sideways comments are made about like the transmission of uh, yeah these things. <laughs> yeah, if you're catering for a microbiology content con- conference, watch yourself, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's aware of the foodborne diseases of the favorite clade that they study. <laughs> yeah. So I thought this was like a funny paper, very short, but but you know, if you're if you want to scare your friends and say, oh, Last of Us might happen, this might be the paper to scare them with. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting. I think that it's uh I like that you kind of linked it there to climate change, right? Like I think that that's something that seems pretty interesting to sort of think about on a greater scale Uh, but at the end of the day right like it doesn't seem like anyone else was infected by this particular fungi this person is doing a job where they're in a high exposure environment so 
Yeah, probably not dangerous for, for most of us. Yeah, probably not dangerous for most of us. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on. We've got cable bacteria with electric connection to oxygen attracts flocks of diverse bacteria. Um, I, I didn't know that cable bacteria was a term. I like actually avoided writing that down at first on, on the Fediverse post because I was like, what's cable bacteria? Then I read this introduction i'm like i guess it's a class of bacteria that people regularly see under the microscope very long bacteria and specifically what they're interested what's interesting about these bacteria is uh you'll find part of the bacteria in uh oxic zone and you'll find another part of the bacteria in like an anoxic zone so they bridge you know the microcosm is like super small like um so even just having like a couple uh micro mi micrometers of length might allow you to span very different environments. Um, and for creatures that are even smaller than that, like you then might be the link between uh, the oxic and the anoxic environment. Yeah, so Faz, the picture you just showed, that was like some pictures of the different bacteria that they saw flocking towards these long strands. Um, yeah. and, and that's the observation that they make. It's, it's purely on a, in a microscope. They have like a very specific type of microscope slide they're using with a trough that's the anoxic part, and then the edges by where the cover slip is, that's where oxygen can diffuse into. And so the bacteria that they're looking at, like they have one part of themselves on one part of the slide, and then the rest of the body is in the trough. And then they're able to do these, um, yeah, take videos and images, and what they see is that the along the length of the anoxic part of the bacteria, um, they get flocks of other bacteria seem to be gathering in that area. And it doesn't happen when the cable bacteria is all in the anoxic zone. It only happens when it, you know, there's, it has one foot in one place, I guess one end in one place and the other end in another. Um, and they have no idea what these bacteria are, right? They're just, they're looking at it under a microscope. <laughs> um, Sorry, yeah. Me, me. So they, they've got this great video that unfortunately is, has, it's been a bit screwed up, but hold on, wait a minute. So hold on a minute. So, I don't know why it suddenly looked like that, but yeah, they've got a video where they actually cut apart the bacteria with a laser, and you can see that <laughs> all its friends start leaving. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's because, the, and that's the essence of this of this paper. <laughs> what happens when you cut the connection? Their friends leave. So, what hypotheses do they think is going on? They think that that connection to oxygen is a connection to a place where you. Can Right, like oxygen is the oxidizer, um, the the best oxidizer we have essentially it, it, on our planet. And so, um, yeah, all these bacteria that are living in the anoxic zone, they want to be doing metabolism where they're dumping electrons onto a terminal electron acceptor. Maybe they're using these cable bacteria as a type of lifeline. And um, they make a lot of notes about how they don't see so much touching. Uh, they're not 100% sure if they can rule out touching. 100%, but they don't see a lot of it. So they think it's probably through like diffusing molecules. Like there could be some sort of common electron shuttle that exists in these environments that allows the bacteria to share metabolism essentially. It's like another, yeah, it's another way of sharing metabolism is by sharing electrons. It is amazing because these actually do act like an electric cable essentially where at one end they connect it to the oxygen and to the other end they connect it to this community of bacteria that use almost like a lifeline, like a snorkel, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it does like fit into like how much symbiosis happens in these anaerobic environments. Because we see it with methanogens, we and we're seeing it here. I mean, it's yeah. really quite yeah. interesting. Yeah, I think that that's like a that's a really good point. Like linking it to this other like we know that methanogen this, it needs that link to oxygen but it also needs that link to no oxygen and so like you get communities forming that do very specific types of metabolism and here it's just another example essentially um yeah i think it's a really cool observation and also uh it helps it helps um expand the mind as to what the orientation is of bacteria to specific metabolisms that there are tons of community-based metabolism that's happening, and we really have no clue <laughs> what's going on right now. Like they don't point, they point to a lot of hypotheses of molecules they think could be going on. They don't even have a model system, so like we don't know specific bacteria and specific uh, metabolisms happening. It's just um, 
it's just a general observation that has really big implications, I think, for, for where we should be looking for these phenomena. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Now, speaking of other things that make us rethink life. Um... <laughs> yeah. Histone organized chromatin in bacteria. So histones are this um, sort of like wrapped up structure of protein where your DNA wraps around it. Uh, really important in epigenetics, right? That histones get modified and that lets uh, parts of the genome become more accessible by you know, RNA polymerase and so forth. Um, it's essential in eukaryotes. Like they mm. mentioned that if you delete histone genes in eukaryotic cells, those cells do not survive. Um, uh, in bacteria, they also have stuff that attaches to DNA. I mean, you can't not manage your DNA. Like I think that having proteins that cover DNA is an important feature. But if you delete those proteins, you don't always get such severe effects. Um, and it's always just being thought that like, you know, uh, bacteria wouldn't have these things. Uh, there are histone-like proteins in archaea, which, you know, archaea are more closely related to us as eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. Um, so maybe it's not so surprising that you would find those in archaea as well. Uh, yeah. But yeah, has never been found in bacteria. And where the authors start off is like the characteristic fold of histones are in some bacteria. So uh, that's where the authors begin and their investigation. Uh, what are these characteristic histone folds even doing in bacterial proteins if we've never really observed them uh, in bacteria to begin with? Um, and they end up making these proteins and they end up crystallizing it with, uh, with, with DNA. And they find that indeed these proteins do stick to the DNA strands, um, but not in the way that we would expect. <laughs> Indeed. Let's see if I can pull that video up quickly. Yeah, so, like, I guess it's not surprising that they don't, like, they just, they have a structure that's a little bit different. So this is the classic, I think, bacteria, or the classic histone arrangement? I'm not I sure. think so. So, like, usually I think that, so DNA has, like, a major and minor groove, right? Uh, that Where, where it tw spits, twists around. And most histones tend to hit the major groove, whereas... This one seems to be hanging off the minor groove, if I recall correctly from the paper. Mm -hmm. is, this a, is this a video? Nothing's moving. It should be a video, but it paused without telling me why, so... Um, there's the video part. <laughs> oh yeah, this is, the, this is the way the bacterial histones, the, the crystallography that they get. So like, this is like, this is not the same. This is like a linear piece of DNA that's covered in these histone proteins. But as I mentioned before, in archaea and in eukaryotes, the way the histones are arranged on the DNA is the DNA wraps around the histone structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These kind of hang off the end. And I can sort of understand, because with archaea, they often live in, well, the ones that we study mostly are in, high, in, in, thermo, in very hot environments where they need to stabilize their DNA as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the idea is our last common ancestor had histones and, and that... So this is kind of an intermediate stage to figure out well what what are what are these doing in bacteria? So mm -hmm. yeah, um, they're they're not in every bacterial clade is what they discover in this paper, right? Like it's only yeah. in some it's only in some lineages do they see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think they also compare like these are kind of less stable than other histone kind of proteins, mm -hmm. right? Where they... yeah. So the the H H FMB, that's the archaea one, I believe. Yeah. And the BD005, that is, uh, that's the, this bacterial one that they're that they're look, investigating now. Yeah. So you can see, like, it, they, um, I think it's something they're lacking some ways of associating with each other, and that's part of why uh, you see it in. That's why. That's part of why you're not getting the same same type of um, uh, histone-like structure uh, fr from these nu nucleosomes. That's the structure they're talking about. Can you get us to um, figure five? I think that figure yep, five has I'll a good eat. image, but but it's like it, it's a similar it's a similar thing. Um, yes, super strange. Uh, this the particular bacteria that they are studying in this in this study is uh, Bedello vibrio, which is just a weird bacteria itself, right? It like preys on other bacteria by in, 
finding its way into their periplasm and then replicating there. So it's like an intracellular, opportunistic intracellular parasite predator is what people typically think of it as of other bacteria. Um, and so it's unclear whether or not this has any relevance to like why they have these particular structures uh, or not, but, hmm. but, but they do and, and it's strange. <laughs> Yeah, right. and I think uh, they do, and once they find the structure, they do like do a fishing expedition to see whether other things, other other bacteria have structures like that, and they find like mm -hmm. uh, Leptospira, I think had had a sim something similar as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But this is still in preprint stage, so there could be more to this that they haven't uh, listed yet. Um, yeah, yeah, I would say like it's a super straightforward, like from the preprint side, like. I guess there probably has to be review on like, are, do these structures hold up, right? They, they do a lot of, um, like they're posturing a lot that like, this is how the histone is gonna bind to actual DNA. Um, but like they're deriving that from a crystal structure. And right. so like, like where I don't have the expertise and where I would be interested in seeing other experts weigh in, like during the peer review process is like, like, is that good enough evidence to say, like, this is probably how it binds to DNA in vivo? <laughs> um, not sure. I'm not sure if there's other lines of evidence that could be used to flesh that out a little bit better. Um, but yeah, I think just like a fascinating discovery in general and highlighting that there's so much diversity in bacterial genomes and we don't have sometimes uh, good descriptions of, of what's going on inside of them. So these rules that we put up, like they don't have histones, like that might not be like a good rule. So many exceptions. In, like... Um, yeah, biology. There's always some kind of exception or kind of some kind of like wooliness around the boundaries. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, and I think the next paper is essentially the same in that same wooliness and fuzzy uh, sort of breaking the rules examples. We have ultrastructural and proteomic evidence for the presence of a putative nucleolus in archaea. Um, and so the nucleolus is a section of the nucleus that they make ribosomes in. And mm. typically people can see it. It's like a super dense, um, different types of stains uh, stain the nucleolus. Uh, and that's partially how it was first discovered, I guess, is like just seeing like, oh, it's like these dense uh, silver stains stain the type of material there. Uh, and that sh makes a dark spot in the nucleus. And so the in this paper, they go in and they look at TEM with the same stains of archaea, because now we can culture a bunch of archaea representatives. Um, I think there's focusing on just one, Sac Saccharolobus sophraticus. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, and they see the staining that, that would be characteristic of the nucleolus. Um, and they do some proteomics to say, like, these proteins are the homologs of the proteins that we would think of as being part of the nucleolus in eukaryotes. Um, not super, I guess, like, in some ways, we should be expecting this. Like, I think we covered a paper recently on the show showing that archaea have, like, cytoskeletal elements and stuff. There's a lot about these mm. cells that are super similar and to, uh, to eukaryotes. Um, and so having the sort of the beginnings of a nucleolus also doesn't seem totally out of the question. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so I think let's bring next, the next paper is an interesting one because it, so Enterovirus A71 is a virus that infects the gut and what they, and this is an experiment in colonic organoids, so essentially like a cell culture but with value added as in for they try to mimic the and how they create them is quite interesting so they, they kind of grow the, these organ cells on like be opposed on the on these beads so they dissolve the beads and then let the almost like turn them inside out so that they can form like microvilli and look very have a very similar structure to how do, out are, how, are you sure they grow do you are you sure they grow them on beads <laughs> I, I can't remember what yeah, I don't actually. Maybe they don't. I don't actually, yeah, I'm not sure. I feel like okay, they because they've grown on basement membrane scaffolds. Um, mm -hmm. that... Yeah, when I was in when I was in grad school, this was like organoids were the big thing, right? I worked on a skin organoid model. Uh, other people were working on these co colonic cell organoid models, and yeah, I think it's just like if they get sat inside of like a matrix of matrigel, then they start to develop in a way where like the matrigel is like. Uh, simulating the basement membrane 
and they end up making like the basement membrane on the outside. On the inside, that's like the apical face of the of the of the organ. Um, and so the what I did what I'm fascinated by this paper is I guess now they can give different like um, growth factors to these uh, organoids at a specific developmental period, and they'll actually have their polarity develop in the inverse relationship. So right. the out, outside is now properly on the outside. So, but this was just like a fundamental limitation of this, of this technology before that like you would always have the outside on the inside <laughs> because you were growing them in a matrix of essentially what was the outside or yeah, yeah was, the, was the inside. Um, I've confused myself by saying outside inside too much, but, <laughs> but, but essentially fine. the fascinating element here for me was that they're able to make these things where they're the opposite. And so um, that will allow them to now more, I guess, precisely look at phenomena that happen on the apical surface of the cells. So that's like the lumen, the actual lumen of the yeah. gut. They have access to in a way that they, we didn't have access to before using, using these models. Um, yeah. So that's, that's my two cents, just to try to locate like why this technology I thought was really cool because I actually haven't heard of it bef done this way before, and it's kind of fascinating to imagine having access to the lumen side in, in a model. Uh, you'd have to do model layers, essentially, in, 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 uh, previously, and, and there has been work on that, but like doing it in organoid, I mean, it opens up another set of techniques, potentially. Yeah, I think this is a key thing that they did here because well, most of this paper is them pointing at a microphone, microscope at something and then seeing some, something very weird happen. So in this case, they infect them with enterovirus e, e, uh, A. I I can't believe I've forgotten it. I just read it five seconds. A seventy one. Um, and what they find is that the the way that the virus spreads in these organoids is very odd because they seem to affect like one set of cells and then those cells kind of stay infected. Uh, so they 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 infect one type of cells because they're these are multiple cellular like kind of organoids. They um, and they tend to to and once they infect the cells, the cells like grow the virus, and then they get spat out by the rest of the, the cells around them. So mm -hmm. in what in something that's like kind of called the uh, person string model, where essentially you've got like one infected cell, and then the other cells close around it until eventually the, the cell kind of pops out, and, mm -hmm. and, and the virus cell and, can stay... Sorry. And I want to say like that, that phenomena is like, for that, that's again one of those things where like, I am so glad these models exist now, because you wouldn't be able to see that if the surface wasn't on the outside, right? And right. it's also a really important process because we know that our gut epithelium is regenerating over time. And so like you, like this is something that happens in the gut. Like it needs to be able to slough off cells that aren't working for it anymore and still maintain like the barrier function of the epithelial surface. Um, so I guess also maybe not surprisingly, like w asking the question, how do viruses interact with this specific uh, physiologic arrangement is is super interesting and we would end up learning stuff about how the virus might use these processes for its benefit um, or maybe how the processes get used as a defensive element for these viruses yeah this is one of those interesting things of where where you, it, in one on, on the one hand this could be a very protective thing for the for the host but on the other hand the virus can take advantage of this to spread more so yeah. they, what they find is that these extruded cells, like they, they don't apoptose immediately. They, what they, they die. They take a lot longer to slow. But the idea is that they can spread to other parts of the body and maybe to other other organisms as well. So, so this is. But the point is, I think for, the, for those cells nearby, they've gotten rid of that. Um, yeah. And they, they really delve into like why did this happen? Is, is it like a specific immune response? And what they kind of find is that this is activated by some pressure sensors. So for some reason the the cells in this virus, they they activate these pressure sensors that cause the cells <laughs> around it to extrude the the cell. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that, again, I'd be is... really I'd be fascinated to know like is this yeah is this some sort of like innate immune response that we're not understanding at the moment, or is it that the virus is is actively trying to get extruded into these things? You know, they haven't dived into it, but I think those are really interesting questions to ask. And again, like speak to an understanding of like where the virus is doing something that causes disease versus our body is doing something that contributes to the disease as a whole. 
Yeah, it's like, say, coughing or sneezing. I mean, that's getting mm-hmm. rid of the virus, but it's also spreading it. But they are physiological responses. So, they're, yep. so yeah, there is one of those things where who's winning in this? Is it, Or is it just a, a screwed up symbiosis where everyone kind of loses a bit? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and this is this is like, like uh, everywhere in, in micro, when you dive into the mecha- me- mechanics of disease, right? Like this is a theme that comes up everywhere yeah like every time you like kind of go into the why of things it sometimes it, the the answer you get is oh stuff happens it's just it's all chaos <laughs> because like yeah well there's like intention on both sides right yeah. like there are protective everything's in process in life and so like there are processes that are trying to keep things safe but then there are other processes that are trying to take advantage of those same processes in order to like extend its own life right and the virus is self-interested in this case yeah. right it, it just wants to spread <laughs> so yeah here you almost like get an equilibrium where the virus kind of wants to be ejected uh, as much as mm-hmm. a, so yeah the local the local area is protected from a burst but it actually sends a, a package of viral uh, a package of viruses down the colon a little bit to burst in another spot. <laughs> yeah, like the same way that cilia move like kind of material or out of your lungs, and then you cough it out, and you're like, oh well, the body's like, oh, we've gotten rid of that, but also person nearby is like, oh, oh no. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Should have worn a face mask. Yes. Um. <laughs> Should have worn a face mask. <laughs> All right. Uh, the last paper that we have for you guys. Hypoxia-induced is... tracheal elasticity in vector beetle facilitates the loading of pinewood nematodes. So these pinewood nematodes are plant pathogens. So they infect pine woods and they like kind of live inside them, but they spread using these beetles. So these beetles also live in pine woods. They dig on the surface in all their larval stages, and in those mm-hmm. that point, the nematodes crawl into the beetles and use them as taxis to 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 reach other <laughs> other spots. They don't actually do any growth or so, like with say mosquitoes and and malaria, the malaria is still living with the mosquito. It's still like mm-hmm. it's mating in the mosquito. It's living its life. These these nematodes kind of just sit there. But the the yeah. interesting thing they that, crawl specifically into the into the spiracles yeah. in, the, in the trachea, essentially of these bugs. And like I don't know, that's a really gross image. Oh, <laughs> if you're you think, like pondering it too much. <laughs> oh, I've got more gross images for you because uh, the thing the the question these researchers are almost asking is like. These beetles can ha- handle 200,000 of these nematodes. So how do they find enough space? And what they find is that, well, they use these, this special sensor to, to f- figure out that these beetles are making it harder. F- these nematode worms are making it harder for these beetles to breathe. And mm-hmm. in response to that, the beetles, uh, they're, 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 their lungs become stronger. more springy. And so you've got like yeah. some... So in this very like kind of old school video they here's like so their like lungs that haven't been infected by the by the nematode worms and they literally pull on them with this uh with with these four yeah. steps to demonstrate that oh look these aren't very springy they just break apart immediately ba- base levels this is base level springiness springiness yeah <laughs> they they look at how springy the beetle innards are <laughs> and then when they've got uh, beetles that are in, infected them, they they start pulling on their their respiratory system with these forceps, That's, and they find that they're they're really springy. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this is just for a visual representation because in the paper they actually like figured out the Young's modulus or whatever. Yeah. They were like they they have like a quantitative way of showing springiness. Yeah, I can't imagine that this is the quantitative way. Yeah, no, they, they actually have like a proper way of measuring it, but this is just for demonstration because it's great when you have an effect that is good enough to show in, in a video, then you should. It's always fun yeah. to have that. And what they kind of yeah. find is that when when these be- beetles are are in this hypoxic state, they uh, upregulate uh, a mucin to to thicken the mm-hmm. extracellular matrix, and then that gives the, the the whole like kind of membrane more springiness. Um, <laughs> And it's in response to being starved for oxygen. Yeah. Because I think they show, like, it's... You get the same increase in springiness when you give, like, low oxygen scenarios for these beetles. Yeah. So it's literally, like, the crowding of their lungs by all these invading nematodes, like, have the beetles adapt, and then that also creates more space for more (laughs) nematodes to crowd in. (laughs) 
yeah, it, it's it's like you know when if you've done game in like university where everyone crowds into an elevator and they get stuck and one person has uh, <laughs> is claustrophobic. <laughs> I mean, it's that's happened to me, uh-huh. but. <laughs> but it is like it's like yeah, a if, game of sardines. If your elevator, yeah, if your elevator was also then alive and accommodated more people going in, yeah, and you guys were causing chaos on different floors of the building, yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you not been to that kind of party, Dan? I, <laughs> <laughs> I have not. <laughs> um. But yeah, I mean, it's super cool, and this is not, this is like, a, this is microbiology that we could really access just through a microscope, which is what is quite fascinating here. Yeah. Um, like, we, we tend to we're focus... talking about a pathogen. Yeah, we tend to focus a lot on, like, um, yeah, uh, single-celled organisms, but these are nematodes. They're also microscopic. Yeah. Um, and the, the level that they're working at, I feel like, in this pathogenic process, it's very interesting to see them, like, sort of like almost directly through their mechanical force, right? It's like just through their body's presence is that they're causing these feedback feedback loops in biology um, that end up like, you know, benefiting them in this case. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's, I just thought it was fun to have like a really just gross paper. And <laughs> just, we, we, all, we often focus on like human like diseases or like cool biotechnology, but what about some gross microbiology? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But I'll also point out that, like, um, you know, nematodes as plant pathogens, that could be really economically important, right? Like, this could we could be talking about ways in which we True. could preserve forests, right? We could be talking about invasives, right? Like, ruining certain crops. Like, yeah, I mean, there's... It's not just gross. I mean, it is gross, but, like, it's not just gross. There's but, also, yeah. like, impact to, to learning about these systems, these infectious systems. Yeah, I, I, I can't sometimes I try to throw in a paper that it's just fun. Just like, okay, mm-hmm. this is a mm-hmm. micro, microbiology and looking at science. It's not just like about the function. Sometimes it's about just finding something that's really interesting in nature and looking into that yeah. and thinking, yeah. oh, look how springy this internal, this poor beetle's insides are, just to allow more space for these nematodes to crowd in. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, really awesome. So that's all that we have for you this week. Uh, join us in two weeks for more cool microbiology news. Yeah. Um, let me scroll down. Uh, we want to remind everyone that while we're very, very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it's possible we didn't get everything right. Science is about thinking crit- critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or corrections, please let us know in the comments. I totally agree. You can reach out to us over Twitter or Mastodon. We both believe that peer review is a process and it requires people to actually read these papers. So if you found something unclear or you have something to add, just let us know. It's been a pleasure chatting. It's, a, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. Stay here, Buzz. <laughs> Tune in next week for more microbiology content. Goodbye. Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> bye bye. Oh, two weeks. Yes, of course. I. Time is a weird soup. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>